everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Research Saturday, presented by Juniper Networks. I'm Dave Bittner, and this is our weekly conversation with researchers and analysts tracking down threats and vulnerabilities, and solving some of the hard problems of protecting ourselves in a rapidly evolving cyberspace. Thanks for joining us. And now, a word from our sponsor, Juniper Networks. Organizations are constantly evolving and increasingly turning to multi-cloud to transform IT. Juniper's connected security gives organizations the ability to safeguard users, applications, and infrastructure by extending security to all points of connection across the network. Helping defend you against advanced threats, Juniper's connected security is also open so you can build on the security solutions and infrastructure you already have. Secure your entire business from your endpoints to your edge and every cloud in between with Juniper's Connected Security. Come see Juniper at RSA 2020 in booth 6161 to see why NSS Lab says Juniper is back in security. And we thank Juniper for making it possible to bring you Research Saturday. Thanks also to our sponsor, Inveil, whose revolutionary zero-reveal solution closes the last gap in data security, protecting data in use. It's the industry's first and only scalable commercial solution enabling data to remain encrypted throughout the entire processing lifecycle. Imagine being able to analyze, search, and perform calculations on sensitive data all without ever decrypting anything, all without the risks of theft or inadvertent exposure. What was once only theoretical is now possible with Enveil. Learn more at Enveil.com. Tragus puts together threat perspectives that take a look at the threat landscape from an industrial cybersecurity perspective across geographies as well as verticals. That's Selena Larson. She's a cyber threat intelligence analyst at Dragos. The research we're discussing today is titled The North American Electric Cyber Threat Perspective. So previously we published one on oil and gas from a global perspective, and this one specifically focuses on uh, North American electric uh, and the threat to uh, electric utilities here in the U.S. as well as the rest of North America. What this does essentially is it provides an overview of the threat landscape uh, it takes all a lot of the intelligence that we work on on my team as a threat intelligence team and provides a sort of public look at, you know, some of the adversaries that we're tracking, some of the activity that we have seen targeting electric, as well as potential future disruption, as well as potential attack scenarios that could potentially affect uh, North American electric in the future. Well, one of the things that you highlight uh, early on in the report is you sort of outline uh, the various activity groups that you're tracking here. Can we go through those together and, and maybe just give us a, a taste of, of what each of one of those groups seems to be about? So we track uh, seven activity groups that target electric utilities in North America. When we say activity groups, this is essentially a collection of observables from um, the adversary, their infrastructure, their behaviors, a lot of the activity that we've seen, and we group them together. Uh, Dragos does not attribute in that we don't necessarily say um, this activity was tied specifically to Iran or this activity was tied to this individual criminal enterprise. We focus our intelligence on enabling defenders to do their job better. And from our perspective, uh, the sort of uh, tying adversaries to states or criminal elements, things like that, it doesn't necessarily matter from a defender perspective because hmm. you can really focus on defending against the behaviors regardless of the entity necessarily that's behind them. So hmm. that's what I'm talking about when we talk about activity groups. So Parasite is uh, one of the newest groups that we ha have identified and we just released in this report because this group does target North American Electric. Um, so they also target aerospace and oil and gas entities. They generally have a broader geographic targeting than some of the other activity groups that we track. But what's interesting with this group is that they largely focus on leveraging known VPN or virtual private network vulnerabilities for initial access. 
So some of your listeners might be familiar with the virtual private network or VPN vulnerabilities that were released back in 2019. Um, A lot Mm -hmm. of intelligence and government intelligence agencies have published reports discussing that APT or advanced threat actors are uh, targeting these vulnerabilities for initial access. So it's not just Parasite that is using um, VPNs for initial access, but we're kind of seeing this activity from other groups that don't necessarily target critical infrastructure. So kind of an interesting data point for us. But again, this is a newly observed group. Um, We do uh, assess that this group might facilitate uh, initial access or further operations for a group that we call Magnalium. Hmm. Um, So I can talk about Magnalium now. Uh, It's kind of an interesting group. So generally, they have targeted energy and aerospace for a while, since at least 2013. And largely, they were active and mostly focusing on um, oil and gas and energy companies in Saudi Arabia or entities with business interests in Saudi Arabia. But we actually identified recently Magnalium increasing and expanding its targeting to include electric utilities um, in the U.S. and North America. This group does not, we haven't really assessed it to have um, sort of an an ICS-specific capability. So like we've seen in previous attacks that leverage ICS malware to disrupt operations or, or, you know, cause really damaging consequences. But they are very highly interested on industrial control systems, entities that have uh, operations that you know, fall in sort of the industrial space. And it is interesting that we have seen them expand to North America. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Xenotime is another activity group that we have tracked who has expanded its targeting to North America as well. We actually reported on that back in 2019. We do consider to be one of the most, uh, if not the most dangerous threat to industrial control systems. Uh, hmm. This is the group that was responsible for the disruptive Trisis malware attack back in um, August of 2017. They were able to sort of infiltrate uh, the operations at an oil and gas facility in the Middle East and deployed highly specific targeted malware in that environment to cause a disruptive effect. We do assess that Zenotime is also uh, involved in in, uh, compromising ICS vendors and manufacturers. This does demonstrate a potential supply chain threat that is certainly concerning to industrial as well. Then we have Dimaloy. So Dynamo, we assess to be a pretty aggressive and capable activity group. Um, We do believe they have the ability to achieve long-term and persistent access, both to the IT side of things, as well as operational environments, Um, generally for intelligence collection and potentially future disruption events. This activity group does have some associations or overlaps with uh, Dragonfly 2.0, as well as Berserk Bear. Mm -hmm. And the group's victims do include electric utilities and oil and gas in uh, Turkey, Europe, as well as uh, here in, in North America. Uh, mm-hmm. We have seen Dimoy uh, expanding its targeting to include the APAC region, um, just based on some newly identified malware samples. And then we have Electrum. So Electrum is interesting. So this is the group that is responsible for the crash override event in Ukraine in 2016. This group largely focuses on electric utilities and mostly targets entities in Ukraine. But it is one of the most sophisticated in that it does have the capability to sort of develop and deploy ICS-specific malware within an operations environment, right? So the crash override malware was pretty unique. It was pretty interesting. Um, It had a lot of ICS-specific modules coded into the malware. Um, So they were able to sort of deploy that within operations to have this um, really disruptive effect. Hmm. So Raspite is another one that targets uh, electric utilities in the U.S., as well as some government entities in the Middle East. This one, we haven't seen new Raspite activity since about mid-2018. Uh, so not a whole lot to say on that group. Hmm. Um, but Alanite is another interesting one. It targets business and ICS networks in uh, the US, UK, largely electric utility sectors. We believe that this group performs reconnaissance in operational environments to potentially dis- uh, stage disruptive effects. Um, but again, this is another group that does not necessarily have an ICS-specific capability. We haven't observed Alanite having one at this time. So Covalite is another one that actually hasn't seen a ton of activity recently, um, but we include any groups that don't necessarily have a ton of activity just because we are ongoing and we are tracking their behaviors and and we'll provide updates to customers, of course, as soon as we identify any new stuff. But they have previously compromised networks associated with electric energy, largely in Europe, East Asia, as well as here in North America. Um, Again, Mm -hmm. largely IT-focused stuff, so so no ICS-specific capabilities. Um, And honestly, there really isn't a lot of evidence or indications that this group actually remains active from an electric or ICS targeting perspective. Interesting. 
Pricing is another one. Um, so this group developed from a campaign, an espionage campaign that really gained attention after uh, the Shamoon attacks back in 2012 that impacted Saudi Aramco. Um, this group has targeted petrochemical, oil and gas, as well as electric generation sectors. Um, we haven't seen them yet targeting North America, uh, North American ICS specifically, um, but they have seemed to have shifted beyond the initial focus of uh, the Gulf region uh, in the Middle East. And we do assess that they remain active as well as evolving. Hmm. Um, and then finally, we have Wastenite. So Wastenite targets electric generation, nuclear energy, manufacturing, and research entities in India and likely South Korea and Japan. Uh, we actually identified Wastenite uh, as the activity group that was responsible for um, the compromise of the Indian power company back in um, the fall of 2019. They largely rely on DTRAC malware uh, that, that was observed in that campaign. Um, and we believe they've operated since at least 2018. Now, in terms of the names that that you're using here for these various groups, are these are these names internal to Dragos? Is is there a, a recognition of these names throughout uh, the industry? How, how does that all land? Right. So we do have internal names uh, specifically for Dragos. However, we do note if they have links to other activity groups. So with threat intelligence, hmm. because so much of it operates outside of the public purview. Um, we can't necessarily match one to one. This group is definitely the group that FireEye tracks as APT10. That's why I hear a lot of people who are, you know, sort of frustrated with the naming conventions when we're talking about adversaries or activity groups or, you know, right. threat groups, what have you. Um, but fundamentally, it's a visibility issue, right? So we don't have the same visibility as any other threat intelligence company, and they don't have the same visibility as us. So we can say, you know, in our reporting that uh, Magnalium, for instance, so Magnalium is a good one. Magnalium does have links or sort of some of the behavior overlaps with um, a group known as APT33. Um, but we can't say, you know, it's a one for one match specifically because we do not have the same visibility as the company that calls it APT33. So, yeah, so so oftentimes, you know, we hear the public kind of complain, like, why don't we have one name for everything? Uh, but there is some 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 science behind that reason. But yeah, so all of these groups, we do come up with the names internally and we'll provide links to other groups when it does have some overlap. I see. Well, I mean, that's sort of the cast of characters. Can, can you take us through some of the, the overall trends and the things that you're seeing when it comes to these groups? Definitely. So one of the most concerning trends that we have observed with some of our activity groups is this concept of threat proliferation. So we have seen some of our adversaries, including Magnalium and Xenotime, who historically targeted on oil and gas entities, largely in the Middle East, uh, and, and expanding their targeting and their activity into um, North American electric. So this report shows that Activity groups are not necessarily focused on one either geography or vertical specific. So that means any operators that are operating in the industrial space have to be aware of all activity groups that are targeting um, any industrial related entity, because at any point they could shift their targeting and begin to target their vertical. Hmm. What we're seeing mm -hmm. here too is it's not that they're changing their behaviors necessarily as they're changing up this targeting, right? So if you hmm. as a defender are aware of the behaviors, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that are used by the various groups, when they do decide to focus their energy and their attention and their efforts on your specific industry, you can be uh, defended because previously you have you know, been aware of this behavior, you have incorporated a lot of the defensive recommendations, and so when they turn their sights on you, it might not be as successful because they're using similar behaviors. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I, I kind of think, uh, this is, I'm sure, an imperfect analogy, but I kind of think of, you know, if you think of all the different stores at the at a mall, uh, you know, if someone's shoplifting at the, uh, you know, the Apple store, or the folks down at the Disney store down the hall, they're still going to have to worry about shoplifters, even though they're in different, you know, lines of the things that they sell. But at the end of the day, they're all retailers. Yeah, and maybe the shoplifter puts it in their right hand pocket, right? Like, <laughs> um, right, right. You can kind of so you right. can train your video cameras on on that particular area, or they normally go to you know this one particular toy section, things like that. Yeah, right, right. And is, so is it? Is it, I mean, is it true that there? So there's a lot of overlap, or a significant enough amount of overlap in the types of tools and things that the folks in the ICS space use, regardless of what flavor of ICS they're dealing with that, that that leads to some of this crossover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's largely similar. Yeah. 
And mm. so, and, and so that's kind of why, while we were largely focusing the report on um, electric utilities, for instance, um, it really does apply kind of across the board here. Um, it was a, kind of the same for Zenotime when we're talking about oil and gas targeting, right? So, so Zenotime had previously targeted ONG, um, but it expanded into electric utilities. The same could potentially be said for entities that you know, will target manufacturing or will target electric. And then they, you know, kind of expand their behaviors um, to these other different um, verticals. So we really kind of want to drive home the point that it's not necessarily, you know, you're not safe because you're not a target. Hmm. Targeting can change at any time. Um, and what remains fairly consistent is the behaviors that these groups are exhibiting. Now, the behaviors change between activity groups. And so, for instance, we're talking about Parasite using VPN targeting, potentially talking about Magnalin using password spraying, you know, Xenotime having the ability to sort of burrow into the control systems network and execute very specific um, behaviors within the control system to deploy its Trisys malware. So individual groups have individual tactics, but, you know, as a whole, they largely stay the same. Um, and that's, you know, this, this idea of, of, of threat behaviors or, or the TTPs, right? You know, when you, you, you kind of understand those and defend against those, um, hopefully you can be uh, defended against, you know, an adversary when they decide to set their sights on you. Now, a good part of the report goes through important information about the North American electric system itself. Um, can you give us a, an overview? What are the things that, that's important for people to understand about the system? Oftentimes, you know, when, when folks will talk about the North American electric system, they use this idea of the electric grid, sort of an electric grid kind of being a single entity. Uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer. Um, it's actually generally referred to as the bulk electric system. Um, so this refers to the way the power is generated, transmitted, and distributed uh, all across North America. And what I really want to kind of point out here is that the, the entire bulk electric system um, is very complex, first of all. <laughs> So this idea of potentially flipping a switch and taking down the entire quote unquote electric grid uh, is is not the reality. Um, yeah. It's also very resilient, right? So you have a lot of threats to the bulk electric system. It's not just from a cyber perspective, right? So anytime there's a severe storm, we're talking hurricanes, for instance, that could be a big one, or um, you know other natural threats like earthquakes that can cause major disruptions. We've seen fires certainly that have major impacts on um, the availability of, of power in certain areas. So, squirrels. Let's not forget squirrels. Of course, yes, squirrels. Yes, animals. <laughs> fire ants. That's another big one, actually. But, but, really? Yeah, okay, yeah. I hadn't heard. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have a lot of these, um, a lot of these threats that aren't necessarily exclusively cyber, um, and mm -hmm. so they have built in this very uh, built up this extremely resilient and segmented system. I also want to point out here too that uh, a lot of electric power enti entities in North America and certainly in the United States have to adhere to, to um, cybersecurity standards or regulations that are essentially put in place. These are basically created by the um, FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, and the N North American Electric Reliability Corporation. So these are, are the sort of governing bodies of the safety and security of the, the electric system, and there are cyber regulations that are in place. Um, that's important to know because you don't really see that with other um, industrial uh, operations necessarily, right? Like you don't you don't have this sort of same the they're called the critical infrastructure protection regulations. You don't have SIP regulations on say manufacturing, for instance. And so they do a pretty good job of sort of establishing these sort of like baseline cybersecurity practices that you have to sort of adhere to, or you could potentially face, you know, various consequences. I believe, you know, they've, they've levied some pretty hefty financial consequences um, in the, up in the millions even in, over the last year because they were sort of not hmm. adhering to these, these standards. And so there are uh, mostly three components that we discussed in, um, in our report. So you have the generation piece of the uh, electric system, the transmission piece, and then you have the distribution piece. And that's what actually gets the uh, electricity out to your homes and businesses and helps you listen to your phone that you just charged and are listening to this podcast right. on. Um, <laughs> right, right. And, and so we kind of use that as, as a base to sort of break up um, the threat landscape from these different um, generation transmission and distribution phases. Um, because we do see adversaries targeting different parts of the electric system. It's not all targeted on generation or distribution necessarily. And so in the report, we do kind of talk about some adversaries who have targeted specific pieces of the grid system. I think it's interesting how different threat actors 
folks have their hand in, in different areas and the things that you've been tracking, they seem to have different, uh, you know, specialties of which parts of, of the grid they're most interested in. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for instance, generation is a really a, a good example. Um, we have seen, you know, three activity groups that have either the intent or capability to potentially disrupt this portion of the bulk electric system. So Daimoy is an interesting, good example. Um, this group actually did target generation facilities um, and was able to obtain screenshots of sensitive ICS data. This includes uh, HMI, so human machine interfaces, for instance, or um, you know, sensitive documentation that, that kind of describes you know, point operations. And so we haven't seen them actually you know, execute an attack like we've, we've seen in, in other parts of the world. We haven't seen them you know, have this sort of specialized ICS-specific malware capabilities, but certainly the information that they could glean from targeting those types of facilities could help them potentially prepare for um, a more disruptive or invasive attack. Well, with the time we have left together, um, can you take us through some of the recommendations that you all have made here? What, what are some of the, the best ways for organizations uh, who are in this uh, line of business uh, to be able to protect themselves? Yeah, so we provided a bunch of defensive recommendations. And I want to make it clear to you, it's not just for electric utilities. Uh, we did certainly map them to any critical infrastructure protection regulations that made sense in this piece. Um, but I think, you know, any sort of industrial operator can read this report and kind of uh, over an overview of the recommendations that we provide and take it to their operators and say, hey, like, here are some of the things that Dragos is saying we should be doing. What are we doing? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and one of the big ones is, is this idea of, of consequence driven, consequence driven security assessments and protecting, you know, these are the crown jewels, so to speak. So this would be identifying and prioritizing your most critical assets and connections and trying to identify the actual consequences of cyber attacks. What happens if they are able to sort of compromise this crown jewel? So third parties is another big one that we've seen from uh, our adversaries sort of targeting those, those uh, sensitive and trustworthy connections between whether it's a vendor and an, a utility or you know, a contractor or an engineer that might be virtually logging into whatever uh, control system environment or their workstation let's say. So you really want to make sure that third party connections and ICS interactions are monitored and logged from the sort of like trust but verify mindset. You really want to make sure that only the people who you are allowing to or you want to be accessing your networks are. This is also too when we're talking about like third parties or supply chain. A lot of times you think about the supply chain piece as hardware backdoors into, into some sort of device that goes on your network and then they can kind of you know, infiltrate or scramble around from there. I kind of want to right. point out here too that the idea of supply chain or the idea of this sort of third party access is not unique to these sort of very sophisticated and complicated and, you know, largely overblown um, hardware backdoors. Not to say that that's hmm. not a threat, right? So we're talking about, for instance, Daimler or Alna is a good example, right? Sort of, you know, targeting or going after um, the vendors and contractors to try and get in sideways and, and use those trusted relationships to pretend to be um, a legitimate or trusted third party. Um, so that encompasses, you know, the supply chain threat. Response plans are really important. That's something that we've certainly seen, uh, not just for, uh, for ICS, but, you know, across the board, we're talking about enterprise as well with all of these ransomware attacks that we've certainly seen an uptick in over the last year. Um, but, but, you know, having a response plan, A, and B, actually practicing <laughs> and, you know, like doing a dry run of these response plans can really help the investigations really lower time to response as well. So um, that's super important. You know, it, it's it's a very interesting report. And I think one of the things uh, that I took away from it is, is the ability to put everything in perspective that, uh, yes, these things are serious. Um, but I think particularly with the electrical system, it's easy for people's imagination to run away with themselves and to kind of imagine a worst case scenario um, and my sense here with this report is that you're putting across the message that, um, yes, these things are serious, but there's no need to panic. Let's stay sober about these and, uh, and address them in a very sort of um, systematic and rational way. Yes, definitely. Um, thank you for picking up on that. <laughs> it, you know, it is really important to us uh, at Dragos to combat this idea of fear, uncertainty and doubt. The InfoSec community calls it FUD, right? This idea of, mm -hmm. oh, the sky is falling when anything happens. 
the threats are real. The threats are very serious. Um, certainly the, the things that we have seen adversaries capable of doing, um, both in the Middle East and Ukraine, is very concerning. We are seeing an interest, an uptick in interest um, in uh, industrial companies in the industrial space. But yes, this message of don't panic, really getting the lay of the land here, really talking about the, the activity that we're seeing, right? So for the most part, our adversaries that we're observing don't necessarily have a, um, an ICS-specific capability like we have seen with Time and Electrum. Um, and also this idea that, you know, the, there are really good people who work in this space who are doing really good work and hyper-focused on uh, protecting our critical infrastructure, protecting um, electric utilities here in North America. You know, like I said, the threats are not just coming from a cyber place. They're also coming from a physical space as well. And there are a ton of people doing really good work to make sure that we are resilient, that we can respond to these things, that we have processes in place to be able to defend ourselves from whatever the threats may be. That's Selena Larson from Dragos. The report is titled The North American Electric Cyber Threat Perspective. We'll have a link in the show notes. Thanks to Juniper Networks for sponsoring our show. You can learn more at juniper.net slash security or connect with them on Twitter or Facebook. And thanks to Inveil for their sponsorship. You can find out how they're closing the last gap in data security at inveil.com. The CyberWire Research Saturday is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Peru Prakash, Stefan Vaziri, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Harold Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.